Good morning, everyone. It's good to see each one here. We do have a number that are out sick or traveling, and uh, we need to keep them in mind as we go along. Also, let us remember the Fords who continually have to be shut in because of Barbara's illness, but uh, we don't want to forget them. We want to encourage them as much as we can. From our lesson this morning, as Christians work together in a local congregation, having the right attitudes is essential. You know, the word attitude in our society almost has a negative connotation about it most of the time. People say such things as, well, he has an attitude, doesn't he? Well, attitudes can either be good or bad. And as Christians, we need to cultivate that the attitudes that are good, the attitudes that are beneficial. And as all the talent in the world cannot make up for wrong attitudes. So many times we've seen congregations having problems, and it's because people don't have the proper attitudes toward God, toward themselves, toward the work. But with the right attitudes, our efforts in service to the Lord are enhanced, and we can live up to our full potential if we do that, <clears throat> have those right attitudes about it. But there are, I believe, four areas of concern. One is our attitude toward God. Do we have the proper attitude toward our God? Do we humbly submit ourselves to him and serve him? The second area is our attitude toward ourselves as individuals. Do we properly look to one another, esteem one another, prize one another as we are seeking to worship and work together? And that's our third area, our attitude toward brethren. Ourselves as individuals, we need to look and look inside ourselves to see whether or not our attitudes are what they should be, and at the same time to look at the attitudes to we have toward our brethren, where we appreciate them, where we care for them, where we love them, as Scripture tells us to. The fourth attitude is our attitude toward the work that we do together as a church. It's good that we're all involved individually in reaching out to the lost and being examples to the world as we live on a day-to-day -day basis. But at the same time, there is work that needs to be done when we come together and when we look to the responsibilities we have as a group before God. So at least in these four areas, we must be sure to maintain the proper attitude. If we're going to be successful, if the cause of Christ is going to prosper in our area, if there are those that we can reach out to and encourage and strengthen and edify. So this morning, I want to start a series of lessons that will focus on these attitudes. Why? So that we can better accomplish that which God desires of us as a local church and that which God desires of each and every one of us. And so I've labeled this series, Attitude is Everything. I used to preach that I thought attitude was like 90% of who we are and what we do. But in reality, I believe it's now 100%. Because if we have the right attitudes toward God, toward ourselves, toward others, toward the Word of God, we're going to be accomplishing that which God wants us to accomplishing, be accomplishing, and we'll be the kind of people that God would have us to be. So, in our lesson, we're going to consider the attitudes this morning that we're to have for our God and the attitudes that we need to have toward ourselves. So together, let's consider some attitudes toward God. If you're talking about attitudes toward God, you have to begin with love. 1 John 4 and verse 8 tells us our God is love, and we are to grow to be like Him. And if we are going to be like God, we must be individuals of love. We must have love toward God, but it must be the right kind of love toward God. There are those that will say they love God, but then they'll go out and they'll do whatever they want to do on a day-to-day -day basis. While they're assembled with the other saints, they may claim to be very holy, very righteous, very submissive to the will of God and to love God. But when they go out on their own, 
they're still <clears throat> showing more love towards self than they are towards God. We must have that love of God that Jesus defined for us in Matthew, the 22nd chapter, and in verse 37. When Jesus was tested by one of the individuals that uh, was standing in opposition to him, he asked him what was the greatest commandment in the law. And Jesus said to him, Matthew 22, verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. We need to give ourselves fully unto the Lord. And our love for him needs to be genuine. James told us a double-minded man will never receive from the Lord what the Lord is willing to, would be willing to give him. But we must have a pure heart and a pure motive to love God with all our heart, to give ourselves emotionally to him, to give ourselves wholly to him. With all your soul, with every fiber of your being, you need to love God. And with your mind. Your mind controls what you think and what you do. And therefore, if we're going to love God with all our mind, we're going to submit to God in every aspect, every facet of our lives. So we must ask ourselves, do I love the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. Well, how can I know that? By some, asking ourselves some other questions. Am I fully devoted to him with all my being? Do I devote my life to him? Or have I only given a portion of my life over to him and keeping back a portion for self? Jesus said in Matthew 16, 24, if anyone's going to come after me, let him deny self, take up the cross, and follow after me. We must give ourselves fully to the Lord, denying ourselves, loving God with all our heart. So am I fully devoted to him with all my being? Is he my top priority? Or do I prize my relationship with him above all other things? When I look to the responsibilities I have to God, it's not only the responsibilities, it's the opportunities and the blessings that I have in response to God. Because my relationship with God is the most important relationship in my life. And it needs to be the, the most important relationship in all of our lives. While it's wonderful to have a loving family here upon this earth, friends who care about you, love you, and look out for you, there is no one on this earth that provides anything better for you than the Lord does. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus told us we're not even to worry about the daily necessities of life. That God knows we need these things. And if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things will be added unto us. So God will provide all those things we need in life. He's already provided us all spiritual blessings in his Son, and now we can have the physical blessings that he bestows upon those who are his children. And therefore, I need to prize that relationship for what it is and for who he is, because he's the giver of every good and perfect gift. In my attitudes toward God, I need to have faith and trust. In our lecture Thursday evening, Rich told us that uh, we need to have great faith in God, that faith is that which motivates us to be obedient unto God. It is that which allows me to completely trust Him. Faith is a strong conviction and trust in the things that one does not see. That's what the Hebrew writer told us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, that faith is the evidence of things hoped for, the substance of things not seen. We hope for an eternal life with God, the blessings that are attendant with it. We can't see that. We hope that uh, we'll be the kind of individuals who will trust God, even though we've never seen God. We can see the effects of God in our lives. We can see the effects of God in his world. In Romans, the first chapter and verse 20, the, the invisible things of God are visible in his world. 
And we need to look around us and understand how, as we studied in our Genesis class, that God brings about, God brought about this world and all that's good in it, saw that it was good, providing it for us so that we might live the life that he would have us to live. We must have faith in him, trust him, that he will watch over us, care for us, and keep all of his promises. We must have that faith because verse 6 of Hebrews chapter 11 tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please him. I cannot be an individual who does not have the proper faith in God and still be pleasing unto him. I have to fully trust him. I must fully commit myself to him. So each one of us must ask ourselves, do I have the kind of faith that pleases God? You know, there are different types of faith. There's a weak faith. There's a dead faith. We need to have a strong and trusting faith in our God. We need to put our lives fully under his will and in his control. And when we do that, and we realize the blessings that God bestows upon us because of that, we need to be thankful toward God. Do you know how many people God blesses every day by extending their lives, giving them the good things in this world, and they never say thanks? You know, there's a... uh, episode in his life that Jesus taught where 10 lepers came to him and he cleansed them of their leprosy. All of them went off except one came back to show gratitude, thankfulness. Jesus asked the question, where are the nine? There's so many people in this world that are that way. They receive blessings from God, but they're not thankful to God for them. Matter of fact, they don't recognize God in their lives as the source of life. They don't recognize as the source of this world, this universe. They don't understand. They don't want to understand how they need to be submissive to him and thankful to him. But we should be thankful. Every Christian should have an attitude of gratefulness to God. The Apostle Paul, by inspiration, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 17 said, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. We need to be thankful for all that God is, all that God has done for us, and all that he would have us to be. You know, there are some people that... (laughs) Look at the command, for example, to assemble themselves together. And they look upon it as a chore, a task, a responsibility that this is what we've got to do. Rather than looking upon it as God intended to be a blessing. It is a blessing that God has given us one another to come together, to encourage one another, to strengthen one another, to edify one another. And we need to, instead of complaining, we need to be thankful to God for the arrangements that he has made in that way. We need to be thankful to him in so many ways. We go to Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 18, and quite often when people come to this, when Christians come to this particular passage, they'll be focusing on why we don't use instrumental music in worship. Well, that's fine. That's a good lesson. But I want you to look at the real lesson here. Do not be drunk with wine, Paul said, in which is dissipation. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Giving thanks always. So many of our songs are designed to do that. But we need to be thankful to God in other ways also. We need to pray with thanksgiving. We need to thank God in our prayers for all of the blessings we receive, the good things that he has done in our lives. Even just hearing our prayers is a wonderful blessing. 
Be thankful to God for all things through Jesus Christ. Are we thankful enough? Sometimes I think it's kind of like when we're young. As a teenager, I can remember my parents provided pretty much everything for me. They didn't want me to have a job, even though uh, I would work a job every once in a while. They, they provided. But you know, as a kid, I wasn't grateful enough. I just thought, well, that's what they owe me. No. I should have been more thankful to my father, who worked so hard to provide for me and my brothers and my, mo and my mother. We need to be thankful to our God, very thankful to our God, for all of the wonderful things he has blessed us with. Because God's righteous indignation is toward those who have become unthankful. In Romans chapter 1, look at verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, their foolish hearts were darkened. They didn't glorify God. Our lives are to glorify God. Solomon, in the end, finally said, all has been heard. This is the conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. It is my all, it's my purpose being here on this earth to give my God glory, to recognize him as the one who has blessed me so well. I need to glorify him and I need to be thankful to him. Sometimes even preachers get filled <laughs> with themselves and their ego is expressed in, look at all that I've done for the Lord. Well, Possibly it could have been the Lord working through me, but all glory belongs to the Lord. All thankfulness should be expressed by us. For an attitude of thankfulness for the blessings we have will help allay the bitterness that often destroys spirit in any congregation. That there's not that happiness, there's not that joy, there's not that gratitude to God, there's not recognizing God, but only recognizing self. Well, then, let's talk about attitudes toward ourselves. What kind of an attitude do I need to have toward myself as an individual if I'm going to work with other Christians, if I'm going to be an asset to them, if I'm going to be one that they can look upon and trust and count on? What kind of attitudes do I need to have toward me? Well, as the attitude that we had toward God began with love, this has to begin with humility. The Bible over and over again stresses the need to be humble. Therefore, a humble estimation of oneself is very important. Look at verse 16 of Romans 12. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. All of us have opinions, but that doesn't mean those opinions are right, or they should be forced upon other people. We need to be humble individuals. Jesus was a humble being while he was here upon this earth. In John the 13th chapter, he stooped and washed the dirty disciples' feet and uh, gave them the example that they should follow his example that they should serve one another, humbly serve one another. We need to be humble individuals, serving our God, serving one another. Don't be wise in our own opinion. Associate with the humble. And I think what it means to associate with the humble is to not look for other people who are humble. That could be a part of it. But 
look to yourself and those qualities that make for humility. Because humility includes a willingness to serve, even to do menial tasks. There is nothing or should be nothing below us as children of God that we will not do. I mentioned Jesus. He set that tone in the upper room when he stooped to wash the disciples' feet. An American industrialist who was the founder of Bell Aircraft, Lawrence D. Bell, said, Show me a man who cannot bother to do little things, and I'll show you a man who cannot be trusted to do big things. We need to be willing to do those little things. Let's go back to Romans 12. Look at verse 3. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. I may not have the abilities that others may have. I may, not, I may fail in comparison to them to the things they're able to accomplish. But I need to look to myself and humbly do what I can do. That's what Jesus said of uh, the woman who anointed him. She has done what she could. That's all that the Lord expects of us, to humbly do his will. So all of us must ask ourselves, am I humble enough to serve my God and my brother? The second attitude I think we need to have that will help us work in the congregation is teachability. If I'm going to be the kind of person that I ought to be, to be teachable is an important quality. For to be teachable is to be wise, according to the Proverbist. Proverbs 15, verse 31, The ear that hears the rebukes of life will abide among the wise. He who disdains instruction despises his own soul, but he who heeds rebuke gets understanding. I need to be teachable. I need to understand that there are things that I continue to learn so that I can be the kind of Christian that the Lord would have me to be. Teachability includes, first of all, an eagerness to learn and grow. I talked about myself as a kid. As a kid, you wanted to grow. You couldn't wait for your next birthday. Now, <laughs> You don't want anybody to acknowledge your birthday. But back then, oh, I can't wait to grow. I can't wait till I'm 18. I can't wait till I'm 21. We need to have an eagerness like that to grow and learn as a Christian, to develop and mature as a child of God, to complete in Jesus Christ. Nearly the very last words of the Apostle Peter was, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We need to have that. Teachability includes also the ability to learn from correction, to profit from advice and criticism. Many times criticism, yes, is unjust, but sometimes it's right and it's proper and it's helpful. And we need not close our minds and our hearts to it when we hear it. And another thing, those who are old, somebody said, well, I'm kind of past the learning stage. Those who are old, as well as those who are young, need to have a teachable attitude. Elton Trueblood was the former chaplain to both Harvard and Stanford universities. And he made a statement, I like this, education is too good to limit to the young. We need to constantly be learning and growing in Christ. And as we learn more, we understand that some of the things we did in the past we shouldn't have done. We've made mistakes. And I think an attitude we need to have is honesty toward our mistakes. This includes a willingness to admit our mistakes and a willingness to correct them. We just completed our study of the book of James. In James chapter 5 and verse 16, it said, Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. We all make mistakes. But a congregation that functions well and grows is one filled with people who learn from their mistakes. Okay? And we need to be those kind of people who have that mind, yes, I made a mistake. I need to admit that to myself and possibly to others. 
and I need to do what I should to correct that mistake and not make it again, but to go forward with a pure heart and pure motive. As we bring our lesson to a close, ideal attitudes make for ideal working conditions, even among members of the local church. Those attitudes that we have considered in this lesson, our attitudes toward God, our attitudes toward ourselves as individuals, will help the cause of Christ in any congregation. The attitudes we have studied will improve our relationship with God, improve our relationship with ourselves, and we'll have a better grip of understanding ourselves. But they will also make us useful to the Master, prepared for every good work, as Paul encouraged Timothy to be that kind of individual and have that kind of an attitude in 2 Timothy 2.21. So, as we close, do we have, or are we developing, the right attitudes of mind? I can't answer for you, you can't answer for me, but we will all answer to our God. We will all stand before our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ one day, and we'll have to give an account of the things that we've done in this body, either good or bad, and I believe that will include the attitudes that we have also. So, we're going to be offering an invitation song. Number 186, Robert's going to lead us in. And if we can help you in some way to strengthen you, to pray for you, we stand ready to do it. Won't you let us, by, and let us know of your need by coming forward while we stand and while we sing.